All right, good afternoon and welcome to today's Richard M. Karp Distinguished Lecture. I'm Sandy Arani and I am the Associate Director of the Simons Institute. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Simons Institute, we are the leading international venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science. Established in 2012 with a generous grant uh, from the Simons Foundation, the Institute brings together researchers from all over the world in theoretical computer science and related fields. And we also support the next generation of young scholars. Um, the goals of the Institute are to explore the use of alg algorithmic thinking in science and engineering, as well as to study the laws of computation itself. Um, we established this Richard M. Karp uh, Distinguished Lecture Series to celebrate the role of the Institute's founding director, Dick Karp, in his role in establishing the field of theoretical computer science, outlining its central questions, and contributing a stunning array of results. Um, the series of features visionary leaders in the field, such as Shahar um, in theoretical computer science, and it's geared toward a, towards a broad scientific audience. So we're very grateful to all the many contributors to the Richard M. Karp Fund who have made it possible to have this series. And so today I'm really uh, very happy to welcome Shahar Lovett. Um, Shahar is a professor at UCSD and he's made many contributions in a broad array of topics within theoretical computer science, complexity, randomness, pseudo randomness, algebraic constructions, coding theory, the list goes on. Um, and he's re received numerous awards for his work, uh, NSF Career Award, Sloan Fellowship, and a Simons Investigator Award. So his talk today is titled, The Structure of Communication. So welcome. Thank you, Sandy. And uh, thank you for you, know, you and everybody else at Simons who invited me. And I have to say, I'm really enjoying this workshop so far. This is sort of the first workshop I've been to since COVID, so for the last three years, so it's been lots of fun. And, and, and the topic I decided to talk about, and also we had some talks during this workshop on related topics, is communication complexity, not just for itself as a research area, because I want to use it as a way of highlighting how questions that come up naturally when you study various aspects of communication and computation sort of are connected and they shed light on questions in mathematics that come up sort of naturally in many different areas. And the uh, topic of this workshop is a structural result. So I would focus on structure questions and, and results that come out of studying communication. And please, you know, if you have questions, stop me and ask. I sort of try to um, prepare this talk to be sort of a balance between general audience and people in this workshop. So I might, I don't know, it's, it's a wide range. So hopefully, you know, do something for everybody. So, so what are the success story of communication complexity? So this area was introduced in the late 70s by Andrew Yao, and his main goal was to use communication as a way of understanding uh, communication bottlenecks in various uh, areas within computer science. And since then, a lot of the work in this field have been on identifying key important problems that come up in communication complexity. And I give some list here for people who know the area. And, and what's important about them is that uh, natural problems are easy to embed in many, many other application domains. So if we understand them really well, it means that we understand really well many other areas. And not surprisingly, you know, after uh, people have sort of spent, you know, maybe decades proving very strong lower bounds in this, for these problems, uh, they were able to be used to really understand questions that come naturally in many other domains in uh, algorithms and in, in theoretical CS in general. Uh, but this is really not the focus of my talk today. Uh, what I want to focus on are sort of the challenges of communication complexity. And I want to make the following point that what we've been very successful with is understanding concrete problems that are important. What we've been less successful with is understanding general problems and how their structure gets connected to how well we can sort of solve them using communication complexity framework. And again, if you don't know this framework, I'm going to explain it in detail in, in a few slides. And moreover, the mathematical questions that come up when you're trying to understand these questions in uh, communication complexity sort of lead naturally into various types of structural conjectures that come up in, in many other domains. And, and really what I want to do today is try to show you these connections. 
So here's the plan for today. So I'm gonna start with like a brief introduction to communication complexity for the people here in the audience who maybe don't know this area well because it's supposed to be a, a broad talk. And then, you know, there's many, many areas within communication complexity. I chose to speak about three of them. Uh, one is the simplest setup where you have two people that talk without any randomness. And we see even there, there are many questions we don't understand. Then we'll see what happens when we add randomness and the picture becomes much more complicated. And then when we add even more players, it becomes even more complicated than we took us. So we'll do it step by step. Again, and this is not a complete you know, list of many more areas that I'm not gonna cover at all. So let's start with a brief introduction to communication complexity. So this is a, the, the setup. We have some players and, and I'm for the most part gonna focus on two players, Alice and Bob. Alice has her input and Bob has his input. And the goal is to jointly compute some function together. What do we make together? So they all, each of them know their own input and they have no, no computational limit. They can compute whatever they want and they trust each other, but they don't know each other's inputs. So they want somehow to communicate with each other and together jointly solve this sort of distributed problem where the global input was partitioned. Some part went to Alice and the other part went to Bob. And again, there's no aspect of cryptography here. There's another aspect of trust. Everybody trusts each other. They just want to solve this sort of computational problem. And the optimization goal is to minimize the amount of communication going between them. So usually there are gonna be some function of X and Y that you want to compute. So how can we view such a protocol from a mathematical viewpoint? So it will be very convenient to identify such functions of two inputs as matrices. So how do we do it? So again, we have this function of two inputs and we're really gonna, in our mind, think of it as a big matrix where the rows are indexed by the inputs to the first player, X, Alice, and the columns are indexed by the inputs to the second player, Bob. And their goal is now so Alice knows the row and Bob knows the column and they want to figure out what's written here at this row and column. And they want to do it while minimizing the amount of communication between them. So what is a protocol? Let's see. So initially they know nothing, right? Everybody knows their own input, but they don't have any shared information. And then let's say Alice speaks first and she sends one bit to Bob. Well, what is this one bit doing? It's really telling Bob that, well, if Alice sends zero, now we know that the input is in some subset of the inputs of Alice. And if she sent one, it's in the complement set. So what it's really doing is partitioning the set of possible inputs that they, that they know where they, the joint input lies into these two halves. And I'm sort of drawing them here as sort of as geometric rectangles, but they don't have to be contiguous. It's just easier to draw it this way. So this is some subset of the rows and that's a complement set. So that's the first bit. So this is what they know so far. And now let's say it's Bob's turn to, to speak. So he sends some bit, B2, and this in interpretation of B2 depends on whether they're in the top half or the bottom half, right? But they know where they are. So maybe if you're in the top half, now the Bob's bit is zero if the input is in this half of the input and other one in this part. And maybe in the bottom, it has some different interpretation. So you see, as they keep sending bits to each other, what they're really doing is partitioning the matrix into like smaller and smaller parts. So maybe now Ellie sends another bit, so there's a, another partition and so on. So at the very end of the, end of the protocol, there is this partition of the matrix and somehow, and what they know is that initially they knew nothing about where the joint input lies. And at the very end, maybe they know that now it has to lie here. Another question, how can that help us compute a function? And here there's gonna be a difference of whether it's deterministic or randomized or whatever is our model. But this is a protocol. Before computing a function, this is what the protocol induces on the matrix. It's a partition. So how, what can we say about this partition? So we said the protocol really corresponds to this sort of recursive type of matrix partitioning. And here's like the first observation. If a protocol sends C bits, so C bits get set from one to the other, then it induces a partition of the matrix to two to the power of C rectangles, right? Because every time you send a bit, every existing rectangle gets split to two parts. So when you do it C times, you get two to the C rectangles. Okay, so we can say, well, we can identify protocols with this recursive matrix partitioning. And you see, just, just so that it's clear, so there's this sort of exponential gap in the number of bits sent versus the number of rectangles, but this is just sort of a scaling. They, they should be both the same thing. And now here's the first question that comes up. But what if we have this general partition? What if we don't have this recursive, nice recursive partition? What if we have this type of like non-recursive partition? Does this also correspond to a protocol? 
Well, not directly, but here's the results. The theorem that Yanakak is proving there. The 90 is that, well, you can slightly refine this and get back into here. And you don't need many more rectangles. Um, so if I have a partition with some number R rectangles, it could be crazy, like that's a sort of recursive partition. You can slightly refine it and get slightly more rectangles. And here's slightly R to the log R, so slightly more than polynomial number of rectangles. And that's going to be a recursive partition, which is the same as being a, a protocol. And so Yanakakis called this a click versus independent set problem because there is a way of recasting this question as sort of a game between a, a game on a graph and one player knows a click and another one's on the independent set. But anyway, just if you look at the literature, this is a, a buzzword around this problem. And for many years, it wasn't clear, you know, if this out of the logger is necessary or if you can do better. But sort of a few years ago, so uh, Mika Goose, who's here somewhere, Mika and Tony and, and so on, they prove that this is actually necessary. So this gap to this quasi-polynomial gap, that's the truth. There are functions where you cannot do better. Okay. So at least I want to say that for our purposes, looking on general partitions or recursive partitions will not really play a big part. So uh, this quasi-polynomial blow up is not going to matter much because very soon you'll see that there are many, many larger gaps that we don't understand. So in your mind, when you think about collection protocols, it's more or less equivalent whether you think about general partitions or recursive partitions, you can move back and forth without paying too much. What does it mean that the protocol computes a function? So, so far we didn't have any function. Now we have a function. So we have some function, let's say it's a Boolean function. And remember we identify a protocol with a partition to rectangles. So for deterministic protocols, one that use no randomness, I claim that this means that they partition the matrix into what is called monochromatic rectangles. I mean, rectangles where all the values of the function are either all zero or all one. Why? Because let's say the players played and they ended up in this rectangle. Well, there's no more communication left. There's no randomness. They need to know the answer. So it better be the case that all the inputs that map to this rectangle give, give us the same answer. So this function must be monochromatic on this rectangle. So again, you can identify the deterministic protocols that compute a function to a partition of this matrix of the function into a small number of, of monochromatic rectangles. And we would like to know what's the smallest number that you can do. Now, there are other models. We will soon see randomized protocols where players are allowed to use randomness. And then this picture becomes more complicated because now they don't have to be correct all the time, just part of the time. And we'll discuss this later. And you can get into like more complicated scenarios like non-deterministic protocols and more than two players, and, and we'll see some of them uh, later today. But for now, I mean, if you've never seen this area before, I mean, deterministic protocols are a good model to have in mind. Just a partition of the matrix to monochromatic rectangles. Okay, so this is all I want to say about brief, brief breakdown into uh, communication complexity. And now I want to move to the three topics ahead. Uh, just looking at two players and the, talking about deterministic protocols. And I want to tell you about this conjecture that I really like called the log rank conjecture. It tries to understand the structure of these protocols. So this is just a, a, a reminder. So we said we identify functions with these Boolean matrices and we identify deterministic protocols with some way of partitioning this matrix into monochromatic rectangles. And again, the rectangles are, although I draw them here geometrically, they really are combinatorial rectangles. I mean, it's a rectangle, just a subset of rows times a subset of columns. They don't really have to be contiguous. But I just draw them like that for simplicity. So here's going to be our first measure of interest, the deterministic communication complexity of a function f. So what is this? It's, you ask, what is the best protocol, the best deterministic protocol for computing this function? And what do we mean by best? The one that sends the smallest number of bits between the two players. And like we said, you can more or less equivalently identify it with asking, what is the best partition of this matrix into monochromatic rectangle, then take log of that. So up to some square factor that are more or less the same. So either way, either viewpoint is fine. And the first question that you might ask from a computational perspective, is this a number that's easy to compute? Now intuit intuitively, it doesn't seem like something that's easy to compute because it seems like a variant of maybe chromatic number of graphs or some other NP hard problems. So it's natural to ask, is this a quantity that's easy or hard to compute? And the answer is it's hard. Um, in what sense is this hard? So there are two lines of work that showed hardness. 
one, that's of this Kushilevitz uh, Weinrab and, and follow up that said that, well, if you make some cryptographic assumptions on, you know, then we can prove this is something that's hard to compute. And, but we really believe that this is an NP hard to compute, but we don't know how to prove it. So there's a line of work that shows that for weaker models or for related problems, this is in fact NP hard. And for example, there's this work of uh, Hirai, Lango, and Loth that shows that some version of this problem, not quite, but a, a related version is NP hard. And this is ongoing work trying to really show that this is a, a hard problem similar to chromatic number, the NP hard problem. So surprisingly, we don't know how to prove it. And, but this work showed that we're under sort of reasonable assumptions, you know, it is exactly or approximating the two, well, it's probably hard. So if you want to understand this from a computational perspective, we should probably look for some weaker approximation that maybe are more feasible to compute. One viewpoint narrative, but something else that's connected to that. This is something that's called the log rank lower bound, and that would list what's called the log rank conjecture. So remember this sort of setup we had. If our function had a protocol, the deterministic protocol that sends C bits, then there'll be a way of partitioning this matrix into two to the C monochromatic rectangles. But here's the first, you see, this is gonna be the first lower bound ever proven in communication complexity, as far as I know. And it says, well, here's a way of showing that you cannot do it. So the, the, the claim said, I'm gonna prove it in a second, that if you view this as a matrix and you ask what's the rank of this matrix, it cannot be very high. Why, is it, why cannot it be very high? Because if my matrix can be partitioned in this case to let's say six, I guess, no, seven monochromatic rectangles, because it's a partition, I can write this as a sum of these rectangles. Every rectangle is either a rank one metric like this one or a rank zero metric like this one. So overall the rank, because it's a, it's a subadditive measure of the whole matrix is at most the number of rectangles. So the rank is at most two to the C. So in particular, it says, if my matrix, so just like in logs here, if my matrix happen to have large rank, then it's deterministic communication complexity has to be large. So this is one technique, the first technique ever invented to prove some lower bound on communication complexity. Okay, so this seems like a very naive way of proving lower bounds here. So uh, what can we say about it? So first of all, to notice is that I didn't, I didn't tell you over which fields to compute the rank. It's a, it's a Boolean matrix. We can view it over the reals, over finite fields. You can choose your own field. But because this is a lower bound, we really try to maximize the rank. And to maximize the rank, we just walk over the reals. The other rank is going to be the largest. So whenever I talk about rank, it's always going to be over the reals. And then there's this very surprising conjecture called the log rank conjecture by Lovas and Sachs from the late 80s that says, well, this should be, this is, although this lower bound seems like it's sort of very naive, it is actually tight. Maybe up to some loss, but not a big loss. Um, so this is what I want to tell you about. So this is a log rank conjecture. It says, let's sort of read this together. Take any Boolean matrix whose rank is some number R. Then, you know, it's deterministic communication complexity is at most logarithmic in R up to some constant polynomial in that. So what I want to do over the next 10 minutes is sort of look at this conjecture and tell you how this conjecture, although I phrased it now in the language of communication complexity, actually came up sort of more or less independently in at least four or five other fields. And how this is, all these things are get, get connected together. So, so far it seems like a very specific conjecture about sort of structure of protocols, but we'll see soon why it's not, why it's much, much broader conjecture that might initially seem. So, but a few comments. First of all, notice this conjecture connects two very different domains. It connects combinatorial properties of matrices like protocols or partitions with sort of linear algebraic properties like rank, which the two things seem to be very unrelated in general, but it's conjecture to be related when the matrix is Boolean. Okay. Some comments. Like I told you, you need to do it over the reals, compute the rank of a small file and fields, we know this is false. Also, we know this constant cannot be too small. We know it has to be at least two. And I'll get to this a bit later. Um, and another reason why this conjecture is interesting because if you believe this conjecture is true, then this will give us a, a, an efficient way of at least approximating the a, deterministic communication complexity of a matrix. Why? We know it is at least the logarithm. And if it's true, at most some polynomial in that. And the rank is something that's easy to compute, right? So that's one way of saying, or that's one way of approximating up to some polynomial factors 
the communication complexity of an arbitrary function. Yes. Should we view this? I give you a matrix, an n by n matrix. That thing would be like a graph. I give you a graph and ask you to compute a chromatic number. It's a hard problem, right? Even hard to approximate. But there was some speculating that for this problem, we can do it better with a polynomial approximation in basically in polynomial time. Any more questions? Do we have any helpless approximation results for the deterministic combination? Yes, yeah, so this is the previous slide. So, here, so, yeah. so, yeah. so this result give low, but also give low for some good approximation. Like maybe constant factor approximation and stuff like that, but not beyond that. Yeah. I think another reasonable question to ask is can you find a different algorithm to approximate this thing? Even if it's not based on rank, and and people have thought about it, and nobody has any clue. But I think it's a good question. Okay. So what, what do we know about this conjecture? So one thing that's easy to prove, and actually let me sort of please show you the proof here for people who didn't see the proof, is that it's very easy to show that there is some bound here. We're trying to we conjecture this polylog rank bound, but really, if I just allow you to something that's exponentially big, just a rank, then this is easy to prove. So let me just at least show you this proof. So no. I guess every talk should have at least one proof and it's better if it's a simple proof. So let's, let's stick with that. Um, so why can you always, if you have a low rank matrix, why can you always find like an efficient protocol for it? So here's, here's one way to do it. So here's a matrix. Let's say it's an N by N matrix. And it has rank R. So let's just for simplicity assume that the first R columns Spin, linearly spin all the other columns. When some R columns do it, so let's just permute them for the first R columns. And we also know this matrix is, is Boolean, right? So all the entries are zeros and ones. So what do we know? If we took a row here and we look on this row, it claims that knowing the values in this row by themselves, you can, without knowing any extra information, you can just deduce all the other entries in this row because all the other columns are linearly dependent. This column, this column, you know the metrics, right? So if I give you these elements here, then you, can, you know everything basically. So here's a protocol. The role player is just going to send these R bits to the other player. And now basically they know the role. They just can just look here on the column and, and tell what the value is. So this will be R plus one bits. This is, this is simple, but we believe this is exponentially far from the truth. So a few years ago, I proved, I improved it by about a, a quadratic factor. And so that's on the upper bound side. On the lower bound side, the best thing we know so far again from this paper I mentioned before, is that there are matrices whose deterministic communication complexity is at least log R squared. So getting log R is relatively easy, but they worked harder and got log R squared. And, and so this, this constant has to be at least two. Okay. So we know something, in, but it's still, it's still, this is still an exponential gap in between two quantities. Okay, so what do we do now? So what I want to tell you is sort of, okay, so I want to leave this picture as is for now. And what I want to tell you now is how this problem about, it seems like it's a very communication specific problem actually came up naturally in at least four other different domains. Um, okay, so, if you think about it, this log rank conjecture, what it really is asking about is you have a matrix that's Boolean and low rank. What can you tell me about it? And this seems like a very natural mathematical problem. So it's not surprising that it came up in many other domains as well. So let me tell you about a few of them. Um, here's one. This would still seem similar to the previous one, but take a small twist. Let's say we have an n by n Boolean matrix of low rank. And this conjecture speculated that this matrix must contain a large monochromatic rectangle. How large? Well, the size of the matrix divided by some quasi polynomial bound. Okay. okay. That's interesting. I mean, if you think about the log rank conjecture, it speculates something strong. It says, well, not only you can find one such rectangle that's monochromatic, you can actually partition the entire matrix into monochromatic rectangles. So this is like a weaker conjecture, but turns out it's equivalent. So there's work by Nissan and Vigleson from the mid nineties that sort of showed that if you can do this generically, there's a way to recurse it and actually be the whole partition. 
So if you want to prove the log n conjecture, it means you don't need to find the whole partition. Just find one large rectangle and just recurse on that. So that makes it easier for us. But this is still a very combinatorial uh, let's say viewpoint. So here's another one. This is coming more from graph theory. So let G be a graph and A be the adjacent symmetrics for this graph. So the other conjecture that came up in, in graph theory is that if this adjacent symmetrics has low rank, then the chromatic number of the graph is at most quasi polynomial in the rank. Well, this seems like a weird conjecture to speculate. So in fact, this question of that sort actually came up in, in the 70s and the 80s by Van Uffelen and Paz Paltovich. Problem pronunciation. And actually, originally, they conjectured much stronger, you know, connection. Like, why conjecture quasi polynomial? Initially, conjectured if this is R, this should be at most R. Well, that will be false. Well, if this is R, this is at most poly R. So, the bunch of work we could conjecture, then basically, at the end of the day, it was realized that these conjectures in graph theory are completely equivalent to the Logrand conjecture. So, like I said, there was a sequence of work started with uh, Alon and Seymour and Razborov that refuted the earlier conjectures. Uh, either formulated in language of graphs or in, in language of communication complexity, but also this, these two conjectures are in fact equivalent to each other. This is so this logarithm conjecture is also a conjecture graph theory, but some ways of bounding the chromatic number of graphs. Here's another way. This would be a geometric formulation. So let's say I give you n points in some d dimensional space and some n hyperplanes in d dimensional space. And I tell you that, well, Every point is at distance one for some hyperplane. So you have hyperplanes, collection of hyperplanes, and you have points. And the guarantee is that every point is at distance one for some hyperplane, but you, know, you don't know for which side it's going to be, either top or bottom. Oops, what happened here? So here's a conjecture coming up from discrete geometry. It says, well, you can find a large set of points and a large set of hyperplanes where all the points are on the same side of all the hyperplanes. So all the points are in some polytope spanned by the hyperplanes. So I'm sort of phrasing it like that. So it's the connection maybe to the original, con the previous connection is clear. It's like, so this would just be connected by looking at the inner product matrix. But you know, the, the way it was formed originally doesn't I mean the connection were maybe less clear. Um, so I think this, con this conjecture that's coming up in, in, in this geometry turned out to be equivalent. And there's this very nice paper by Singer and Sudan from, from last year where they studied this and some other generalizations and all of them tend to be equivalent to this logarithm conjecture. So, um, so all these questions in discrete geometry also end up being equivalent. So here's another one that maybe is a bit more surprising, something called non-negative rank. So I want to define this question, this notion because it's gonna come also later in the talk. So what's the story here? So linear programs in general are a very useful commonly tool commonly used tool in optimization. And in the 90s, there were like a sequence of paper people said, oh, I can prove this, and I can solve this NP-hard problem using this sort of super sophisticated linear program. And so it became harder and harder to find bugs in these papers. So what uh, Yanakakis did in, in, the, in the 90s to say, well, let's develop a general technique to prove that none of these things is going to work. So this is, no, reject all these papers at once, right? You don't need to actually check them. Nothing like that is gonna work. And he did this by developing this whole system of showing that this complexity of linear programs can be characterized by a quantity called non-negative rank of some metric that I'm not going to define to you called the slack matrix that sort of is defined by this linear program. So I just want to talk about this non-negative rank. So what is non-negative rank? So let F be some matrix with non-negative entries. So what's the rank? The standard rank. So the standard rank of a matrix, one way to say it is say, well, it's a minimal R, I can decompose my matrix as the sum of R rank one matrices. Right? That's like the standard usual definition of rank of matrices. What's non-negative rank? It's the same thing, except that we require that all of these matrices in the decomposition have non, the rank one, but they have non-negative entries. And this non-negative rank played like a huge part in this program developed by Anakakis. And for general matrices, it's very easy to construct examples where the non-negative rank is huge compared to the rank, but there is this conjecture that says that for Boolean matrices, there are no big gaps. They're more or less the same. And again, this is all equivalent to this logarithm conjecture. So I mean, the, the goal of me telling you about all these different sort of formulations is just to showcase that this question is really a question about 
structure of low rank Boolean matrices came up in at least five different domains, so more or less independently. So it's a very natural question to try and understand, and we really understand it very poorly. So just to summarize deterministic protocols, so like I said, the deterministic protocols are a partition of a matrix to monochromatic rectangles. There is this log rank, which is a lower bound, a very simple lower bound for the deterministic communication complexity. There is this log rank conjecture that says it's also an upper bound up to some polyfactors. And that this question is really a question that has nothing to do with communication. It's really a question about structure of low rank Boolean matrices, which I think is a supernatural mathematical question that we want to understand better. So I'm gonna to move to like talking about randomized protocols next. So first, are there any questions about anything I said so far? Oh, oh maybe before that, one more thing. So there's, since we don't really understand how to prove this log rank conjecture for deterministic protocols, it makes sense that you want to consider some interest in special cases. That's a good way to make progress right? in general in research when you're stuck. And it turns out there's this special class of functions that's called lifted functions, where the, on the one hand, they have enough interest in structure that you can sort of study them and get interest in properties of them and, and learn new things. And on the other hand, they're simple enough so that we can actually prove something about them. That's what is interesting. I'm not going to define them at all. I just want to, to say that for people who are interested in this line of research, just be aware that this area exists. There's tons of, tons of research on it. And it's sort of looking on a special case on the one hand, but it's on the other hand, it connects all this question in the communication world to the simpler world of query complexity in Boolean functions. Some people have talked about over this week. And a lot of these very fascinating connections between these two fields. But again, I'm not going to talk about this at all because no, I only have an hour. So, okay, let's move to randomized protocols. So here's the picture, picture is going to become even less clear. So what are randomized protocols? So we now allow the players to use randomness. So up until now, there was no randomness. Everything was deterministic. But now we're going to tell you where we're going to give the players an extra resource that can use randomness. So what do we even mean by use randomness? So there's two models that make sense here. One is this model that's called private randomness, where every player has their own source of randomness, but it's, it's secret, only, only they know it. The other model is called public randomness. It says, well, there's this in the cloud, there's this global source of randomness that everybody can use. Maybe it's like the digits of pi or something, some global randomness. And for the most part, these two models are more or less equivalent, except for some minor issues that people who know them know them and people who don't shouldn't care. Uh, and, but today, just for you know, simplicity, I'll, I'll talk about public randomness. Okay. But again, if you don't know these models, they're more or less equivalent. Minor differences. Okay. That's public randomness. So let capital R be some source of shared randomness that everybody gets access to. So what does it mean to run a randomized protocol? Here's one way to think about it. So we sample this joint public randomness, and based on that, we run some deterministic protocol. So you can think about a randomized protocol as really some distribution over deterministic protocols. Okay. And so you can imagine you have a bunch of these sort of partitions, each corresponding to some deterministic protocol. You have some distribution over them and you choose one of them and just apply it to your matrix. What does it mean that this computes a function? Well, now it's that it's randomized. Well, you do the usual thing. You want to say, well, for every input, I want to be correct with high probability. So you choose one of these partitions and you want it for every input, you get the right value with let's say 90% probability. So again, let's, let's let another notation, randomized communication complexity of F is gonna be, well, if you're allowed to use randomized protocols, what's the minimal number of bits you can use? So this would be a line randomness into the picture. Okay, and let me show you two examples of randomized protocols. The first one, probably many of you have seen, the second one, maybe less of you have seen. Um, so equality. So let's say the two parties want to check if the inputs are equal. So what can they do? Well, first of all, what is the matrix viewpoint of that? Well, equality should be one if the inputs are the same, should be zero. Otherwise, they just want to compute the identity matrix, right? So here's the identity matrix. One player knows a row, the other player knows a column. They want to see if they're the same. Here they get one. So one thing we can already prove just based on what we've seen today, if this has now, this does not have any 
uh, non-trivial deterministic protocol. Why? Because the identity matrix has rank N, it's a full rank matrix. So this log rank lower bound says, well, you need to send at least log N bits. But log N bits just send the whole inputs. So that's like a trivial protocol. But I, I want to show you now that uh, using randomness, public randomness, to be precise, you can just do it a constant in many bits. So you can say what the number of bits that you're sending. So how do you do that? So here's a protocol. So we're going to use the public randomness. That's, and so think of it as be really describing a hash function from a domain n to let's say 100, some large enough constants. What are the players going to do? Well, they know this public um, hash function. And they're just going to apply to the own input privately. So they get each one a number between 1 and 100. And they just compare the numbers and see what they get. Okay, they just replace these numbers. And why is that going to work? Well, because if the two inputs are equal, then they're always going to get the same answer. But if the two inputs are not equal, then like with 99%, they're going to get different answers for the hash function and they're going to reject. So this is okay, a very easy way of using um, randomness. And actually for you know, some years, you know, some of us thought, look, is this the only way that you can use randomness? But turns out, no, there are other ways you can use randomness. That's not the only way. But it's a very good way of using randomness. Like in most cases where people use randomness when they design protocols, that's all they do. And then apply more stuff on top of that. Okay, but let me show you another way of using randomness, uh, which is, again, a, this is a, a, a function that was discussed today in one of the talks. This is going to be the Hamming cube function. So your inputs are x and y, which are now n bit strings. And what you want to figure out is that if x and y form an edge in the Hamming cube, which is just a fancy way of saying, they differ in exactly one bit. So what you want is to figure out if you know you have your x is let's say you know x1, x2, xn, and y is y1, y2, up to yn, if there's like a single bit where they differ, we see maybe a zero here and a one here or the other way around. Now I'm claiming that this is also something that we you know we can do efficiently. And this is this actually, you know, I learned in this paper of uh, Liana and Puya and Hamed who are all here somewhere. Um, it's a really nice uh, protocol. So what do you do here? Well, first thing, just make sure X and Y are different. So you can reject. You're using the equality protocol we saw in the last slide, just reject if they're the same. Otherwise, you use the following subroutine 10 times. So what's the subroutine? Again, we're going to use our public randomness to randomly sample a set of coordinates, one of them, uniformly. So every coordinate appears to be half. And we're going to check, is this true that X and Y differ on the set S of coordinates, and they also differ on the complement set. If this happens, you know, then again, we can reject, because they differ in at least two coordinates. And if, if after running this 10 times, you didn't reject, then you accept. And this, you can show that this only accepts X and Y that differ in exactly one coordinate. That's not hard to show. So that's a different way of, sort of using randomness to solve problems that doesn't seem like maybe that obvious how you use randomness to solve. So here, two, these were two examples. So what can we say about randomness protocols? So we know that for deterministic protocols, there is very nice combinatorial viewpoint. Well, they're the same as a partition to rectangle. So it was a very nice combinatorial way of uh, characterizing them. We had this logarithm conjecture that tried to characterize them using linear algebra. Can we do similar things for randomized protocols? And basically, they want to argue that the answer is in general, we don't know. Like already there, we, there are many things we don't know. So let's try, let's try to do that. So what did, let's remember what we did for deterministic protocols. We said, well, if the deterministic communication complexity of a function is C, then it's ranked at most two to the C, and we use this to prove the log rank lower bound. You can do something similar in the randomized world and say, well, if the randomized communication is C, then some other notion of rank called approximate rank is also small. And I mean, I have a definition here, but I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, there is some notion of rank that also seems to characterize randomized communication. And, 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 and so you can, so for example, there are examples like maybe the equality function or the identity matrix where the rank and this approximate rank are very different from each other. And one hope that people had is that, well, maybe similar to the log rank conjecture, where rank was a lower bound, maybe this approximate rank is a characterization, or at least to some extent, of randomized protocols, and why not? So in fact, Lien Schreiber made the following conjecture that is exactly the analog of the log rank conjecture, except that we replace deterministic protocols with randomized protocols, and we replace rank with approximate rank. 
And for like several years, this was open and people tried to prove it and they failed. And then we realized sort of they failed because it's false. So, okay. There was this sort of a really nice work by Chatopatai, Mande and Sharif a few years ago, where they gave a counter example. So this is a, not just false, this is completely false. As false as you want it to be. Sort of, they gave a, a, a very nice function called the sync function, I'm not going to define, whose approximate rank is some number R, but whose randomized communication is not logarithmic in that, or point logarithmic, it's polynomial in that. So really, this is not the right way of characterizing, you know, um, randomized communication using linear algebra. Okay, so what can we do? Well, one thing this teaches us is that if we thought we more or less understand the structure of low rank Boolean matrices, once you allow this low, low approximate rank, they have much richer structure. So we, we understand them much less. And there are these very surprising examples that come up to seem to behave differently to what people conjectured before the, the structure should be. Okay, so you know, can we use linear algebra in any way to try and characterize randomized communication? So we said this is this approximate rank of a matrix, which was, again, now let me define it slightly more formally, it says the minimal rank of a matrix that approximates your function. And if you remember, we defined this non-negative rank before, so you can do the same thing for non-negative rank, and you can ask, well, why do we do it? Well, it turns out you can use this measure, whatever this is, approximate non-negative rank, is also a lower bound for, you know, randomized communication. So you can ask, well, maybe this is going to be, maybe you should replace approximate rank with that. So there is a conjecture that's sort of a bit of a mouthful, so I'm not going to read it here, that says, well, maybe. So there's a conjecture that says, well, maybe if this is small, you can do something. I mean, nobody knows. I mean, might be true, might be false. I mean, the only reason why I think this is a very interesting conjecture is that it's not that this approximate and negative rank is equivalent to a measure that people use a lot in communication complexity to prove low bounds. It's called the smooth rectangle bound. So if this conjecture happened to be true, it would show that this lower bound technique, that is a very natural lower bound technique in communication complexity, is complete. It's a polynomial factors. And currently, we have no clue if it's complete or not. So I think that's an interesting conjecture. Or people who like, like structural conjecture, but in linear algebra. Um, but now let's try to like, you know, aim for like, you know, let, let, let's lower the bar. Let's aim for like, you know, more, more uh, less ambitious goals. Since we don't really understand the structure of you know, general randomized protocols, let's just ask, can we say something about super, super efficient randomized protocols? One that just changed like, say, like two or three bits or 10 bits. Can we at least understand them? Okay, so what functions have constant randomized communication. So this is like a very, should be like a very simple question. Like what functions require like, you know, 10 bits to compute if you use randomness? And we saw some examples, but uh, told here like this equality or Hamming cube, but in general, that's that we don't know. We don't have a classification. We don't, but we really don't know. We know some examples. And, okay, maybe, I'm gonna skip this slide. There's some connection between this and question that come up in, uh, geometry and in, in machine learning, or maybe for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this. Here's uh, can ask me afterwards. Um, so here's a conjecture that came up in part of this research that says, well, if you have a function that has constant randomized communication, you should have some combinatorial structure. Concretely, we conjecture you should have at least one large monochromatic rectangle. Why do we conjecture that's true? Well, it's true in the two examples we know. Okay, <laughs> so maybe it's true, who knows? <laughs> Uh, maybe it's false. I mean, we only have to, so two examples, you can have, make many conjectures. So it's super quality. If I see quality, here's identity, here's a big zero. Hamming cube, we could do something similar right now. We really don't know. I mean, tomorrow, one of you can come up with a counter example. So this has come to show that we really don't understand the structure of randomized protocols. Even simple functions like that are completely open. And, and also more interesting, I think that there is also, so again, the same paper by, by, by Liana and, and, and Hamad and Puya, they, they show that, well, there's a slightly more general conjecture that if it is true, would give a connection to a very surprising field in algebra called true algebras, where there's some conjecture, stru structural conjecture there that ended, ends up being sort of equivalent to understanding the structure of randomized communication protocols. And you can ask them later if you want. Okay. It's a very interesting, surprising connection. Yeah. Just to summarize what we know about randomized protocol, we really don't understand them. I and mean, if we thought we don't understand deterministic protocols, we really don't understand randomized protocols. There is some natural analog of flowing conjecture, but it ends up being false. There is some refinement, which may or may not be true. 
And you know, I claim that for deterministic protocols, our gaps are quantitative. We don't know what the right bounds are. For randomized protocols, we have qualitative gaps in our understanding. We don't even know if something is constant or large. I really have no idea. Okay, so I'm gonna end talking about randomized protocols. So let's see if we have any questions. But then I'm going to move to the last part of the talk. Is going to be what if we had more players into the mix? But also, really, the only simple functions that we know of uh, randomized protocols. We can generalize like Hummingway two, Hummingway three, but let's be more specific. Okay. It's a great question. Find another function. Quantum randomized computation. And in general, for a lot of the structural conjectures, finding more examples is really useful. It allows you to rule out many conjectures to understand what should be the right special questions to ask. So I think it's really important to find you know, more, more examples. Yeah. So I'm not going to talk about quantum computational complexity. That's another area I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to say anything about, but also there, there are a lot of interesting structural uh, conjectures that come up. Yeah, but I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, the last, last thing I want to tell you about is about. What happens when we add more players into the mix? So I'm just add one more player, three players. And even for three players, there are already two models that you, you could consider. And I'll tell you briefly about both of them. One that's called number in hand, one that's called number on the forehead. And they both, I think, shed different light on, on the questions that come up when you add more players into the mix. And of course, you can add more players and do more models, but, but let's just stick with these two simple models for now. So what is this number in hand? So here's a model, so you have three players, this is dog, cat, and owl, and each of them have their own input, and they want to compute a function. So that's like the most natural extension of the two-player model. So if you have two players, now we have three players. So remember for two players, we said we can identify a function on two players as a matrix. And we can identify protocols as partitions of this matrix to rectangles. Well, if something very similar happens when you have three players. Now, instead of matrices, you have three-dimensional matrices called tensors. And instead of rectangles, you get cubes, and you get exactly the same behavior. So nothing special happens here. So it's, just, it's tempting to ask, can we generalize the log rank conjecture to this domain as well? So, okay, so what would be the log rank conjecture? Well, there's a very natural notion of rank of tensors, that is the analog of what you get from matrices. And, and it's easy to prove that it's, it's still a lower bound for the deterministic community complexity of this function, this model. And you can ask, well, is this also an upper bound? And so to me, surprisingly, I haven't seen any works that actually try to study this question. It's a harder question compared to the log rank conjecture. It contains a special case. So maybe don't try to prove it, but maybe it's false or maybe it's equivalent. I don't know. So I think it would be very nice if some of you try to understand what can we say about the log rank conjecture analog when we add more players into the mix. Surprisingly, nobody tried to do it. Okay. So what is this other model? This was one model, this number in head, the most natural extension. What's the other model? The other model is maybe less natural, but ends up being even more I think, interesting. This is called number on forehead model. And if you've never seen this name before, it's very surprising why it's even called this way. So I'll tell you in a second. But, but here's the way you should think about it. So you have again these three players, but instead of now each, and you have three inputs, but now each of them know, knows two out of the three inputs. So there are a lot of shared information between the players. Each one of them knows two out of the three inputs and they want to still compute this function. So it should be easier for them, right? By the way, so why is this name number on forehead? Well, in the original paper that introduced this model by Chandler, First and Lipton, they sort of vision this sort of a card game where you know every one of them has this sort of card stuck to their head and you know they see all the other inputs. So if you came to Liana's talk yesterday, she had this really nice sort of Cartoon of that, that's, that's my best. So, and I can, that, this is my limit. I can do cartoons, but so, um, yeah, so imagine they have the, the input stuck to the head and they see all the other inputs except their own. Oh, but you know, if you just think about each of them knowing two out of the three inputs, maybe that's more convenient. So, what can we say in this model? Well, because they know more information, it's easier to design protocols, but on the flip side, it's harder to prove lower bounds. And what I want to tell you is that somehow proving lower bounds in this model ends up being super important and related to many questions that come up naturally in other domains. In particular, I want to maybe spend two minutes telling you about how questions that are, I think, natural in this model gets connected to questions that are very natural in edited combinatorics. And, and to me, this connection is super surprising and, and sort of insightful. 
but there are about two connections like that. One of them that I think we've already also heard about during this workshop is this connection with something called the corners problem and the exact end problem. So I'll tell you what this is. So here is the corners problem. It's a problem, it's a classical problem in study for at least 50 years in native combinatorics. It says, what is a corner? You have pairs of numbers in the range one through n. And a corner is just three numbers that look like that. So the difference here is the same as the difference here. That's a corner. And the question there is, what is the largest set in the grid one up to n up to one up to n that does not contain a corner? So it's like a classical random question. And there's been tons of work on it and we, don't, we still don't know the answer. But turned out that the communication complexity problem that seems very natural, that is exactly identical to it. So what's the, what's the question here? So you have three inputs in the, in the range one up to n and the players just want to see if they add up to n. That's it, should be easy, right? And we're asking, but now each of them knows two out of the three inputs. They're not allowed to use randomness and they want to still solve this function. So the surprising fact here is that these two questions are in fact equivalent, completely equivalent. If you I mean a solution here, translate the solution here and vice versa, and you lose almost nothing. And sort of, this sort of leads to the hope that maybe we can use techniques coming from communication complexity to try and, and improve our understanding on questions in, in additive combinatorics. Let me do about another example like that. I think it is even more surprising. So here's a question that is maybe to some extent one of the crown jewels in a remedy theory and, and, and in the metrics, it's called the health jute problem or theorem. So it needs one definition. So the, we work in the domain of, of strings of length n, where, where the digits is one to three. And we say the three, three percent like the x, y, z form a combinatorial line, sort of if they look like that. If in any column, either they're all the same or it goes one to three. So this, is a, this is x, y, and z, so that's a combinatorial line. And I get the same type of question. What's the largest set of strings one, two, three to the n that do not contain a combinatorial line? And there have been tons of work on this problem and the bounds we know are really poor and this is like a really important problem in, in sort of friendly theory. And turned out that again, an equivalent question for it. I think it's very natural in the communication world. So what's the problem here? So the players receive inputs and now the inputs are not numbers. Now every input is a subset of the numbers one through n. And the goal is just to check if the three sets they got form a partition of one up to n. So it sounds very natural. And again, you want to do it without using any randomness. And again, so uh, Adi Shrav and Proof a few years ago that these two questions are again equivalent. And I think it's very interesting to understand and looking at other questions that come up in additive combinatorics and remedy theory, do they have equivalent formulations in this communication world? And already there have been some, I'll say, so far mild progress in improving bounds and constant bounds in the uh, Ramsey world using techniques coming from communication. I think that a lot more work that can be done and a lot more connections that can be discovered. Um, one last thing. So I'd say one, one thing here, so I think we'll run, start to run out of time. So if you, took, if you take functions, if you take functions in two players, it's very easy to come with examples where randomness actually helps you. So you can sort of, like a quality we saw, deterministically you need, basically there are only three real protocols, but with randomness, you can use other one. But when you go to more than two players, to this number on the forward model, really we didn't have strong separations. And the best separations we had came from these separations that we had in, a, in, in, in remedy theory, like the corners problem. And so only recently, you know, we were able, this is with a, a, a Zender, Kelly, and Ragumeka to get stronger separations in this NOF world. Uh, that so far don't directly connect to problems in, in ethical but have, that's sort of inspired by them and probably that we'll discover more connections along the way. And wait, that's okay. So if you are interested, I'll just say here's a function that's easy. That's that easy to state the function at least. Um, that's easy for randomizing and hard for deterministic. So take some large finite field, take vectors in some constant dimension and subspace that's where 40 is just a large enough constant. And, and what the players want to check is that you know, if all the inner products of the inputs are the same or not. And turns out this is easy for randomized and this is like very hard for deterministic. And also here, although there's not a direct connection, but the proof builds on this sort of the head is Kelly and Meg had this really breakthrough result several months ago in edit combinatorics and this sort of builds up on their techniques. So and now just summarize. So for this multi-party protocols, we had these two models. One was this number in hand model. It was a natural extension of the two 
player model, and here there's this natural log rank, ten, log tensor rank conjecture that I really invite people to sort of investigate. I think it's a very natural question to study. And then this number on the forehead, with this information that is shared between the players, then the lower bounds here are really intimately connected to very natural problems that come up in, in Ramsey theory, additive commentators, and so on. Just to get, summarize the whole thing, I think that questions that come up in communication complexity expose a rich structure in a number of mathematical you know, areas and domains, and they sort of are connected to sort of interesting problems that come up in, in a lot of domains. And we saw some of them today, and there are many that I haven't discussed today. And I think they just ex give us many interesting problems to explore. So this is it. Thank you. So do you ex expect that there should be a um, number of forehead functions with like optimal um, separation and bounds? Like That's a good question. There is no reason why not to. There are technical challenges, but possibly. Uh, there's other nice uh, notions of rank for tensors like slice rank. Is it all helpful to look at this in terms yeah, of? Yes, so, so far the handling. And this communication and you know, it's very natural that you can other notions of rank and see if they make sense there. Oh, I think some of them don't, like slice rank doesn't actually slice rank doesn't talk, but the other ones are. Is there any uh, non-trivial upper bound for the log tensor rank injection? Yeah, I mean you try to think about it. Probably the reason it just was surprising to me while I was preparing this slide. It's this question is very natural, but nobody it never came up in the literature. So, so in the number of foreign models and second complexity, we think of the number of players is very large. Does mm. this also correspond to anything in addition to the Okay. So correspond to try to find a longer trade progression. So we really don't know how to do, right? Only very recently we will improve one for three. So maybe at some point. There are a lot of technical challenges to overcome that. So, having seen these protocols for the first time, the quality and hemming problem as if the relative advantage of the randomized protocol hinges a bit on the fact that it's sort of much more likely intuitively that two strings are not equal rather than equal. Similar for the, for the hemming problem. Yeah. Is there a problem? Yeah, a problem or rather a function where the zeros and ones are more balanced and still the randomized protocol has a large advantage. Do it for some like cheating. Let's say I want to check if x and y are different, but then so with one, then each player gets like you know n bits like x and y, and then another bit, an extra bit, and you want to solve these two bits with the answer of whether x and y are equal or not. So yeah, it's the balance was sort of not in an interesting way. Yes. I think I'm asking is there seems to be a little structure. Underline the ability to find these efficient randomized protocols, but we still don't quite know what this structure is. There's this uh, work showing that even if you have an access to inequality protocol, it's not enough. Yes. So, so that's underfunding, we don't have equality at all in some way. I mean, but then they don't, but they don't have randomized. Yes, yes. <laughs> then they're going to do a study above, right? above, a study above conference communication, right? No, no, no. no, I mean, this is one doesn't have equality. Oh, is there an analog of the log rank conjecture for the number of random? Um, I mean, the even notion of rank corresponds to something called silver intersections, but it's, um, yeah, I could try to do it, but it's not clear what to do with it. So. Um, I know that some prominent theoretical computer scientists have publicly said that they think the log rank conjecture is false. If you had to guess, uh, which way would you guess? I think the log rank conjecture is one of these conjectures that we actually have a lot of examples, but it's true in all of them. So I think this is more, in my opinion, it's more likely to be true than false because it's not that we have like, you know, one example or two examples. There are families of examples, but we know it's true. On the other hand, all these families look sort of similar to each other. So there are some examples of the new family, but at least we have more than one example. So it's true. So I, 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 would, I would bet that it's true.
Thank you.